Check rate of radioactive decay. Increase the Flash Gordon noise and put more science stuff around. stuff about Martha Stewart. I tell you, from when I was talking to you about how cool Martha Stewart is this week. I love Martha Stewart. Hmm. And with that, I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of Half Glass Gaming. <laughs> really mixing it up uh, this week. Um, with, with a traditional wire whisk. <laughs> But, uh, so anyways, my name is Julian Watkins, of course. I am the moderator. I'm large and I'm in charge. And when you see him, tell him Large Marge sent you. As with always, as with always, I'm with, as always, <laughs> the Rev. Uh, I am the Reverend. That's who I am. I got Mandy. Hey. I got Mandy's fandies. Hey. <laughs> Her fandies are all Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just Josh. Yeah, there it is. All right. So, uh, Rev, I understand that you had uh, attended a uh, function. Yeah, I uh, attended a convention called MarsCon mm. uh, that happens every year here in Minneapolis, Bloomington, greater Minneapolis air- metro area. So Hilton? Uh, yeah, at the airport Hilton. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is ostensibly a science fiction convention, although I go there because I have a connection with the people who run the music track. The person who usually runs it is uh, Luke Sinowski, the great Luke Ski, who's a comedy music artist. And so he usually stuffs the stage with a bunch of other comedy music artists. Mm -hmm. He's also the storyboarder for a cartoon show called Mighty Magiswords on Cartoon Network. Never heard of it. Uh, It's it's a really hilarious show. Uh, This brother and sister find a bunch of ridiculous magical swords like Swiss cheese sword and tuna fish sword. and It's ridiculous. Are they all food related? No, there's like an accordion sword and... Just like whatever ridiculous ass sword people can like they can come up with. Is there an ass sword? Uh, I think that Cartoon Network would not allow an ass sword. It was Adult Swim. I don't know. It's not Adult That's Swim. True. But yeah. yeah, so I I went to that and it, it, it's always a lot of fun. I, I usually go. Yeah, and I also go because I get to spend time with my girlfriend from mm-hmm. Chicago. She comes down for this convention mm-hmm. uh, because she also has connections with the people who run the music track. Yeah. Uh, and so it's nice to spend time with her. Yeah, you know I have to brag on. her. Because it's been since the last time I had seen her that I really, like, came out as trans. Uh, So, you know, this year I packed a couple of dresses and I wanted to spend at least one of the nights at con just presenting as female. Uh, And I was a little worried because, you know, I went in there realizing that it could legitimately be the end of the relationship. But my girlfriend was just fantastic about it, uh, left, right, and center, got pronouns right, and she was just... A wonderful human being. So I had a really good time at this year's MarsCon. You do more of the like the music stuff. Is there a lot of like sci-fi authors and things like that? Uh, there is some sci-fi authors. I cannot remember who was there specifically for as the author guest of honor. Uh, the con guest of honor, they, they always have some sci-fi actor, uh, like, and I can never remember actors and actresses names, but one year they had the actress from Farscape who played Chiana. Ah, Carmichael. Possibly. Adriana Carmichael. Who did not know what a Tootsie Roll was. I was, I was surprised. I offered a, a Tootsie Roll and she's like, so what's that? Uh, chocolate taffy? Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> so, well, you don't know what a Tootsie Roll is either. <laughs> it's a Tootsie Roll. That's what it is. As soon as you're question on it though you're like oh what is a tootsie roll <laughs> for the record I, I just want to say i made that name up <laughs> and i don't remember her name that could be it <laughs> the, the actor is played shiana um okay. <clears throat> this year it was and i can't remember his name but i remember him from one bit part mm-hmm. the episode of doctor who where matt smith uh is murdered and an old guy walks up and like you know gives them a gas can and says you're gonna have to burn the body he played the old guy hmm. it's malcolm something oh malcolm mcdowell that might be it does he like english yes did he talk like this uh, <laughs> yes yeah. did you make up that name no as that's, well? bad. that's real <laughs> So he was the, the guest of honor at this year's con. Uh, so yeah, they, like, cool. they have a lot of sci-fi stuff. It, it's really a sci-fi con. 
I just tend to hang out with the music track more often than not. Mm -hmm. How many Doctor Whos were there? Well, there was a lot. And (laughs) and then I bought the War Doctor's Sonic Screwdriver. And so I was just Sonic Screwdriving everything Mm. because that's what you do when you get a Sonic Screwdriver. And, And of course, now I want all of the Sonic Screwdrivers because I am obsessed and I have a problem. Does it look like a wand? The In the classic Who series, it was just a screwdriver that was made noises. Ah. Um, but in the reboot, since Eccleston, they've really kind of treated it like a magic wand, depending on who was writing the episode and what era it was. You could get some vodka and mix it with orange juice and then put a shit ton of like blue dye in it. So it's like electric blue and call that a sonic screwdriver. I would be surprised <laughs> if they don't have a sonic <laughs> screwdriver drink, honestly. <laughs> Uh, now, Josh, I understand that you, speaking of sci-fi, have been reading some science fiction books. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of science fiction lately. It's a, a phase I go through every five years or so, apparently. <laughs> Once I start reading science fiction short stories, I get hooked. And I I just read and read and read. I also write science fiction short stories hmm. too. And I have found out recently, so I want to, like, I got an honorable mention in uh, the L. Ron Hubbard Awards uh, back in, it would have been quarter four of 2010. And I just, it was just a contest I submitted to. And I was like, oh, you know, I bet they just give an honorable mention to everyone. Who, no, no, they really don't. And <laughs> it turns out they don't. And it turns out, like, if you get an honorable mention in the L. Ron Hubbard Awards, it's like, a huge deal mm-hmm. and i was like oh yeah. shit i didn't realize mm-hmm. that if it's good enough they'll option it to be a movie starring john travolta <laughs> and so i've been reading some of the the winners like some of the people who have won a lot of people i've read actually who i really like have started out that way and hmm. i was like oh wow they release anthologies every year of you know there's their uh, all, all of their winners and there was an essay in the one I was reading the other night about how L. Ron Hubbard was like the greatest writer in the world. And it's like <laughs> greatest in the world is a, a, a little. Mm-hmm. I don't I, 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 I don't know. I don't think he was that great. I, I think it's awesome that he put so much of his money and so much of his estate into like helping other science fiction writers get established. I think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. But I have a hard time, you know, admitting that he was even like a scientist. If I great, like I yeah. certainly wouldn't put him on a level with like Phil K. Dick or Ray Bradbury or mm-hmm. like people like that. No, I I think most people who know his name know his name because of the religion he started. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and and yeah, <clears throat> that's fair. But you know, I'm not gonna tell someone that their favorite author isn't good. Mm-hmm. I know nothing about Scientology except for that Tom Cruise apparently is one. <laughs> yeah. And that Al Ron Hubbard started it. But like someone in a com in an internet comment in a forum thread I was reading you said that scientologists believe that all writers are like secular prophets no only those who write space opera style stories Mm. i mean i I like i kind of like that idea of like you know all writers being prophets but then i think about how like 99.9 percent of writers are bad writers and Mm -hmm. then i stop believing it (laughs) oh no scientology isn't that like based on midichlorian levels or something (laughs) uh essentially they Mm. uh they yeah, you they get call your, your e-card but... reader or something. <laughs> yeah. PK, uh, is it a PKE reader? I, I can't remember. It's I, a PKD reader. I, I yeah. can't remember what kind of reading it is. But yeah, like essentially uh, the alien Xenu, and, and I'm probably mixing up specific details, but alien Xenu, deep in the Earth's crust, explosion of Thetans, and now everyone is unhappy because their Thetan levels are too high. Just for the record, <laughs> none of us know anything about Scientology. I know a little bit about <laughs> Scientology. So, I'm, like, I'm not a Scientologist, but I know Scientologists. A warning, a warning <laughs> and, to our listeners: if you're planning on being a Scientologist, I know Scientologist sir, don't and take our no word for it. <laughs> and and not only that, I one time uh, applied for a job with the Church of Scientology downtown. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, and like, they they don't actually want to hire you for a job. They they want to uh, get you to join Scientology. Mm-hmm. So you know, they they had me watch this indoctrination film to explain what, but this was many years ago so i don't remember specific details yeah i uh, i just saw the movie 10 cloverfield lane uh, how was it that was a pretty fantastic movie not a whole mo- mess of sci-fi in there but there's some is that related to cloverfield at all loosely okay but um 
for the most part, it's a good chunk of the movie is just three people in a bunker. And, you know, you got your John Goodman and uh, what's her name? Mary Winstead. Uh, and some Maybe other Joe. The there you go. Who actually plays the daughter of John McClane in one of the Die Hard movies. And then at one point in this movie is crawling through a vent <laughs> in a tank top. Oh! <laughs> uh, all, all you need is for her to say, it, ho, 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 I've got a machine gun. Yeah. <laughs> yippee ki Or better yet, now I know what a TV dinner feels like. <laughs> so with that, I think uh, I'm going to call a break. Are your Satan levels too high? They're need way to clear too them high. Out? Yeah. I got to... <laughs> I'm not going to even say that, but <laughs> as always, of course, I'd like to thank uh, 2XAA and Wheelie for their contributions, musically, of course. Um, also, uh, Retrovolve.com is a website. We're on there. There's game articles. Uh, you can go to HalfGlassGaming.com for detailed lists of all of the games and sometimes other goodies that we talk about uh, per episode iTunes. You can go to iTunes, subscribe, download, rate, send us a check. Uh, Stitcher as well. Jeepers. Send us a Stitcher. Yes. Yeah, send us some patches so we can stitch up our pants. Uh, and with that, uh, when we come back from the break, <laughs> we're going to be talking about some sci-fi stuff. And we're back from the break. We're going to start talking about some sci-fi games. I think it's a genre that, uh, for me, seems like it's kind of underrepresented, but I think surprisingly it's everywhere in gaming, I would say. Retro era, uh, there was a lot of sci-fi games just because sci-fi was really easy. Mm -hmm. You know, Space Invaders is technically sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Before we start the conversation, I'm going to posit that very early, you know, 70s and 80s, sci-fi and video games were very closely tied together mm -hmm. i'm waiting for mandy to either prove or disprove that by the mm -hmm. end of this conversation mm -hmm. so mandy i guess we'll start with you then some of the earliest video games the very earliest video games in general mm -hmm. were sci-fi games there was space war in 1962 mm -hmm. which would probably be the first sci-fi video game there are so few video games in the 60s that there there wasn't a lot of competition and uh Space War is interesting because it's really just a basic shooting spaceships game, but uh, it was actually directly inspired by the Lensman series by E.E. Doc Smith hmm. because he liked to write these big, long space battles where the heroes were in like a desperate situation and they had to come up with last minute ways to fly their way out of it. And he's like, oh, I bet that would be really good for a video game. And he was at MIT. They were doing experiments with computers uh -huh. and the capabilities of these computers. So they wanted to figure out whether they could use that computer to power power a game and so he brought that story to life in the very limited way that he could in 1962 nice and uh also the first arcade game in 1971 computer space was also a sci-fi game and it is also in the movie soylent green mm -hmm. an excellent sci-fi film that i actually don't like that much i oh, like yeah. the i like the snl parody mm. a whole lot spoiler alert it's people <laughs> <laughs> oh, have you seen that SNL bit mm -mm. where it's it's they keep making Silent Green sequels and finding <laughs> ways to do it? So it's like Silent Green is still people. They didn't change the recipe like they promised they would. It's people, <laughs> and then it's like Silent White, and it's like Silent White. It's like paper, and the paper is made of people, <laughs> and they just don't stop. There's like ten of them in a row, and it just keeps getting stupider. And so to be it keeps getting funnier oh yeah but yeah that was one of the first video games to appear in a movie wow so no they have a lot of a lot of first um it's a big part of the early days of games mm -hmm. and then, um actually bane books who's a major sci-fi publisher b-a-e-n right b-a-e-n yes uh, they actually, in 1982, they started their own video game company, Bane mm. Software. I think it's pronounced Bane Software. <laughs> That's why I spelled it, just because <laughs> to avoid that exact situation. <laughs> 
science fiction is almost like a go-to <clears throat> genre for early gaming. Right. So Space War was the first multiplayer mm-hmm. game mm-hmm. ever made. Oh, is that right? Yeah. The, so the first action RPG was Panorama Toe, which is a sci-fi game. The first game to use cutscenes was actually the deluxe version of Space Invaders. Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first game with polygonal graphics was iRobot, which is not really that much like iRobot. But oh, okay. I mean, the movie iRobot wasn't very much right, like yeah. iRobot either. Except it had Will Smith in it, so I mean. It had Shia LaBeouf in it back it, when it did. he oh, didn't have right? a career, really. And and <clears throat> that's exactly like the story iRobot, which, yeah. you know, also starred Will Smith and Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I Robot was actually based off one short story called, uh, I think it's called Robot Dreams by mm-hmm. Isaac Asimov, mm-hmm. which was in a story collection called I Robot. And in that story, they realized that they um, created a robot and the robot starts having dreams. And so they... it's, it's because the person messed with the programming of the robot because she wanted to see if she could make it feel emotions like a human did and mm-hmm. it started dreaming and it was recognizing itself as a human in the dream and dreaming about starting a robot uprising and so they kill it at the end mm. <laughs> which is the opposite of the movie because they're like oh no we've got to protect them now and so yeah. it's like yeah but you can't say spoiler after you spoil something <laughs> 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 It's from it's it's old stuff. Yeah, it's from a story published in your entire life. If you were listening to this podcast, you probably had your entire life to read that story. The story it was written in what, like the early sixties. Yes, you've had your chance, guys. (laughs) And I ruined it. I had my chance, and I ruined it. You you did. Of course, I'm remembering the movie The Last Starfighter. Now that we're talking about the loving relation between movies and video games, mm-hmm. which for those of you who haven't seen this, you know, 40, 50 year old movie, uh, The Last Starfighter. How old do you think we are? <laughs> I don't know How about you. How old do you think we are? I what year do you Starfighter think it is? is I'm 50 I'm years 327. <laughs> I don't know about well, the rest look, of you guys. Well, look, there's no. Oh, no for I the record, Last me. Starfighter came out in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The 80s is like 40 years ago. No. It was 30 years ago. That's almost That's 40. close. Come on. Almost I, like 10 years. I came, I came out in the 80s and I'm not 40 yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, which literally came out. <laughs> uh, the Last Starfighter was about this teenager who did really well on this arcade game and it turned out the arcade game was actually a test to see if you should be a space fighter pilot there mm-hmm. we have the video games kind of informing the movies informing video games well and that's interesting because i think uh the first couple of science fiction games that come out they're really just science fiction by default they're based in some sort of a space world or something but there's no actual story to the science when does that start to come in uh really not so much till the 80s but i think that's true of video games in general that in the very early days they were just figuring out how to make video games at all (laughs) and they weren't to the point where they could put a real story in but uh i think there were stories behind the games that creators imagined in their heads and even if you read like the box descriptions for a lot of those old games there are these deep stories that (laughs) even in the 80s that's true there are Mm -hmm. these deep stories that never make it into the game because you know just programming characters there were such strict limitations i mean it's not a lot of data by today's standards Mm -hmm. but like those couple of megabytes were even kilobytes were just massive back then when they had so little data to work with yeah so uh as soon as they could basically and i think people imagined stories even space invaders Mm -hmm. like there's a story there it's just not in the video game so how does the term space opera or space fantasy differ from sci-fi space opera is its own sub genre of science fiction it's more about civilizations where humanity has mingled with aliens and exploring Mm -hmm. you know involving a lot of space travel and things like that okay and i would i would say that that is you know stretching the definition of of Mm sci-fi mass effect yeah exactly mass effect uh star wars is you know the quintessential space opera Mm -hmm. right there's a lot of science fiction that's that's a lot 
you know, plays it a lot closer to reality Mm -hmm. uh, where they take a scientific concept that's currently in development and then, you know, spin off of that. Like, you know, say at Jurassic Park, Mm -hmm. when we were very uh, heavily looking into the idea of cloning and creating cloning livestock and things like that. um, That was uh, that was a thing in the, you know, late 80s, early 90s that was actually happening Mm -hmm. in um, in the scientific community is something we're thinking about. And then uh, Michael Crichton wrote the book Jurassic Park, which was taking that idea of what was happening in science and extrapolating and say, well, you know, what if we take that concept and, you know, start bringing back endangered species or extinct species and mm-hmm. like, you know, what if that eventually becomes dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's uh, typically what they call hard science fiction, which is science fiction that adheres closely in comments on current developments in science mm-hmm. and tends to explain a lot of the science in, in the story. Mm-hmm. It's a lot less robots and aliens and a lot more modern technology being Mm -hmm. extrapolated. I actually uh, have discussions about the hard and soft sci-fi with uh, author circles that I'm in uh, because, like, I don't feel that just the hard, soft different, like, really encapsulates it. I think there's also needs to be another axis. So like Josh was saying, hard sci-fi means it's much more technical, much more specific to real science, whereas soft sci-fi is, well, we've got robots. Uh, they work because robots. Uh, you know, they don't right. really, like, hard details aren't as important. Or yeah. aliens, they work because aliens. B- right. We can't understand it Right, yet, you so. know, that that's a psychic power because of genetics and not, you know, magic. So that makes it sci-fi. Uh, but I, like, I and others feel that there should be a second axis, which... I like to call sharp and mild because I like cheese. Uh, but the <laughs> idea is there are stories that are hard sci-fi. I like Swiss sci-fi. Yeah, right. There I are like stories, good sci-fi. sci-fi, you know, monster. Uh, <laughs> there are stories that are obviously high, hard sci-fi, but the science isn't very important. Like you could, you could just take the advanced science out of the story if you wanted and the story would not be hugely different. It would just, you know, instead of this hard science tech toy, they would have a regular gun or whatever. Uh, and that would be mild sci-fi, whereas sharp sci-fi is the science inside the story is so important to how the story is told that you you can't remove it. Like, it's just, it's vital to the story itself. But that's, I mean, that's the kind of science fiction that I really like. Like is, Primer? Yeah, like Primer, where it's, it's very much explicit explaining like a rule of physics or a rule of science and you you understanding these rules is very important to how Mm -hmm. the movie plays out Mm -hmm. or how the book plays out or the story i i tend to not get wrapped up in the details uh, in the hard sci-fi as much Mm -hmm. uh i i personally tend to go towards science fantasy which to go back to your question about science fantasy Mm -hmm. uh, i think sci-fi works if you consider it as kind of an umbrella term for a bunch of Mm subgenres. Uh, and science fantasy is in that where, yeah, this, this ray gun works on magic because it does. So, I, I mean, like, I think there's uh, an argument to be made then that current games, at least, people say are sci-fi, maybe more specifically fall into these categories of space opera or science fantasy or space fantasy. Or a lot of games that don't get labeled as science fiction are actually at the roots of science fiction. I mean, like, the entire Metal Gear series is very science fiction. Mm. Very much Very so. bad science. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. It's not, yeah. It's not good science. But I mean, one guy grafts another guy's arm onto his body and then has his consciousness inside of him. Like, But, there, is, you know, there's a lot of technology, a lot of, you know, strategy stretching the boundaries of what current technology would be able to accomplish in in the Metal Gear series. Yeah, no, Metal Gear is absolutely a science fiction. I mean, look at it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it's hard to say, you know, like I think of, I, obviously, I guess Jurassic Park um, would be more of a hard science. Or high, but what would you say like a game like uh, Bioshock? I would call Bioshock soft sci-fi. I mean, they've got an underwater city because they've got an underwater city. Shut up. Mm-hmm. Now, 
there have been people, specifically Matt Pat with Game Theory, uh, who have gone step by step to explain that an underwater city actually is scientifically sound. But, you know, they weren't worrying about that. They're mm-hmm. like, you know, here, it's genetic magic powers. Mm-hmm. That That's very much soft sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Mandy, do you have any examples of what you would consider to be like a true sci-fi game? I mean, there's Kerbal Space Program, which is just a space flight simulator Mm. basically uh it was officially released in 2015 but it has been in early access since 2013 okay and uh nasa actually directly worked in the development of that uh when they released the initial version they were so impressed by how accurate it was that they're like oh hey come work with us and they're like here you can see like our data from exploring this asteroid and so now you can put this in the game yeah and so nasa worked about it's used in schools and used with kids you know, kids that used to go to space camp, maybe mm-hmm. their parents would pay for it, and now they can just go on school computers and fly in space. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's uh, the game Waking Mars, which is basically a Mars biology game, and uh, it's heavily based on the National Geographic book Our Universe, which uh, is an encyclopedia that categorizes all the known aspects of the solar system mm-hmm. and shows what kind of life these various planets might be able to support using real science. And so they took all that science and they created like an entire system of plant and animal life that could potentially exist on Mars and looked at what it might look like and built a whole game around that. And see, the thing is, though, that these games aren't really story-heavy games. They're more toy box, sandbox type games, Mm -hmm. but really heavily based on very real science. Interesting. So a lot of games that I like um, fall out things of that nature. Were these inspired by science fiction novels? Because it seems like there'd be a great wealth of information and and backlog material to sort of make games based on. Fallout's based on There Will Come Soft Rains by Ray Bradbury. There you go. No, and Halo, I guess. I'm not super into Halo, but Halo, or the the Ringworld books, but Halo apparently rips off the Ringworld books Mm -hmm. really badly to the extent where a lot of people claim they're just... (laughs) <laughs> unlicensed Dream World games. I mean, at this point, the Halo license is almost certainly more valuable than the Dream World yeah. license. Yeah. No, I've I've never read ring world it's it's on my list of two reads i've read you've read a lot of larry niven i've read some larry niven he wrote that one story you really like he wrote uh inconsistent moon which mm-hmm. i really like mm-hmm. inconsistent moon is a fucking great story but i've read the back of ring world <laughs> like several times and every time i'm like wait isn't this just a halo <laughs> like <laughs> I don't read as much sci-fi. I I read a lot more fantasy. But I would like to point out the Fallout series as a really good example of soft sci-fi that is still, you know, what I would call sharp Mm sci-fi. Because you you can't take the science fiction out of Fallout and, like, still have the game. Mm -hmm. Like, it's impossible. But nobody's going to say that Fallout functions on any kind of real science of any sort. Fallout is built around perceptions of the future that were based on bad science. Mm -hmm. And so they're very strict about following those rules, but the the science behind those rules was wrong. Yeah, like a nuclear reactor in your car. Yeah, but I mean, it's almost all of it is based on real stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that happened, but that people thought or like propaganda that was out there. And Mm -hmm. so the idea is, what if all this bad science was good science? Mm -hmm. (laughs) But uh, to the reverend this point it even if it's bad science if you take that out of fallout it stops being fallout right right and it does like the story so it's soft up to a point but it's hard well i would say what if this bad science was not bad science Mm -hmm. is definitely Mm sci-fi i mean it kind of science fantasy it's definitely sci-fi it's it's not hard sci-fi because Mm -hmm. hard sci-fi is based on no here are actual science rules let's see what what fantastical elements we can do with it Mm -hmm. or you know presume cryogenics Mm -hmm. what happens to reincarnation i mean it kind of it kind of starts soft and then it gets hard well Well, i would just (laughs) i would say that 
uh, what Fallout does is just have a consistent in-world setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't make it hard sci-fi, in my opinion. It's just consistent with its Well, there's a difference between science fiction and science fantasy it, and hard sci-fi. Mm-hmm. And science fantasy is like when they're not trying to follow a system of rules and it just works because it can. And I mean, Fallout has a pretty strict system of rules, really. It's mm-hmm. just not based on real science. Mm-hmm. I think the confusion is with what hard sci-fi actually is and then with what the reverend's cheese sharp scale. sci-fi would actually <laughs> My cheese scale yes would actually be because the hard sci-fi and what the rev calls sharp sci-fi are two very different things mm-hmm. yeah, right they're not mutually exclusive but they can be and mm-hmm. and, and follow an example of where they're right at. so space opera metroid i i wouldn't call the uh the first metroid a space opera just because, like, there's no real interaction or, or drama there. It's just the one character. So then what would you quantify that as? Just, just a sci-fi story. Just a sci-fi story, huh? I, I feel like, like space opera is very dependent on human, humanity interacting with other, you know, sentient life forms and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, like, other colonies and cultures and mm-hmm. things like that i mean you can have stories with aliens that aren't space opera mm-hmm. well, let me ask you this there are a number of different uh, genres that kind of toy with the science fiction elements do you think there's one in particular that's a perfect fit or a better fit for sci-fi fps third person action racing i mean science fiction is so broad it works with with everything, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of science fiction RPGs, there science are fiction a lot shooters, of science fiction racing games. Mm-hmm. I play a lot of Wipeout, F Zero, right, right, Sonic and Tails <laughs> Racer. <laughs> Those creatures are abominations. <laughs> Uh, well, so like you take a game like Battlefield, add in some Star Wars spice, and you got Battlefront. Does that make it more appealing to you, Josh? I don't know, because in the early days, I was huge into World War II shooters, and that was like my genre. And I don't I don't know why the World War II setting was what I liked so much, but it was. Mm-hmm. And that was why I was so resistant to like the Halo series, because I was like, I don't want sci-fi in my, my multiplayer <laughs> shooter. Yeah. And now, all I play is Star Wars Battlefront, which yeah. is a uh, science fiction first-person shooter. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at the same time, like i gravitate toward starcraft over mm-hmm. warcraft okay <laughs> like warcraft is the fantasy version and starcraft is the science fiction version mm-hmm. i don't know why but the the starcraft thing really like i really like it mm-hmm. I can't really explain why I think that, mm-hmm. but I, I just, I gravitate toward that and, you know, that one thing over the other. Yeah. And I wouldn't necessarily say that the science fiction makes it a better series, but it makes it more appealing to me, yeah. I guess. For me, that's the same for racing games. I would much prefer to play something like, a, you know, F-Zero as opposed to just like a Formula One racing game or something. I don't tend to gravitate towards the sci-fi games. I tend to play a lot more fantasy. Like the Fallout series is a great example of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is no functional difference between Skyrim and Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's just wandering the, the map, doing the exact same thing, except in one no, you no, hit no, them with a... There's small I think, functional but differences. Small, but like more or less, it's, mm-hmm. it's you know... Yeah. The skill points. Right. I need to point out that they started out as series developed by two different companies, and they've only become more similar over time. Mm-hmm. Well, I, Fallout Three was the first one developed by Bethesda, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, it, Fallout is the Elder Scrolls was guns, mm-hmm. more or less, at at by this point. So I should like Fallout at least as much as I like the uh, Skyrim. Mm-hmm. I don't. I mean, those games are so much about being involved in the atmosphere and the culture and all um, of that. that. Right. I think that stuff matters way more. I, and and that, that might be it. Like, I yeah. haven't sat and, like, really analyzed it bit by bit. I just, like, I don't like Fallout as much as I like Skyrim, mm-hmm. even though gameplay-wise, I probably should. I, I actually prefer science fiction to fantasy when I'm, like, picking a movie or a book or whatever, but... 
but I'd probably prefer Elder Scrolls to Fallout, at, at least at this point. Mm-hmm. I've only played Fallout 4. Yeah, I've Fallout only played 4, Fallout 4. Wasn't as good as Fallout 3. But mm-hmm. I, I have played uh, both Oblivion and Skyrim. Mm-hmm. I've got Morrowind and Oblivion and Skyrim. I like Morrowind, didn't like Oblivion as much. Uh, I've got Fallout 3 and I've got Fallout New Vegas, which Mandy got me New Vegas, mm-hmm. and I feel bad that I haven't put more time into it than I have mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, it was so nice of her to get it for me. But, you know, and like they're good games. Obsidian made New Vegas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But like they're good games. I'm not saying that they're not fun. I They don't do it for me mm-hmm. the way Skyrim does. Mm-hmm. I feel like I would actually probably really like New Vegas. You might. It's very um, good about repercussions of choices, which almost mm-hmm. all choice games are bad at. And like the perks were actually much better designed than Fallout 3 or 4. I don't think the exploration is very good in New Vegas, but you no. never explore. So yeah, I don't that think was you my one gripe. Find... The exploration was so good in Fallout 3. Like, yeah. I just loved going to those really weird, like the Gary Fault. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's like my favorite thing in the world was just yeah. like picking a direction and walking and finding these bizarre cults, basically, that people lived in. And I found that in Fallout, if you go off the map, there are some really weird cults in Fallout 4. Yeah, and you know, and that's what I liked about New Ve- uh, Vegas was like the the modding for the guns, um, the survival mode yeah. stats, and uh, no, New some Vegas of the perks is bad at exploration, but, but yeah, good at everything else, and you never yeah. explore. So well, you and probably I don't, really like New Vegas. All of the houses no, I don't, were empty, basically. I don't Vegas. explore in Fallout Four because I don't think the environment's very interesting. It's not. It's not three. Where it's oh, like, I mean, come on, there's and still it, good stuff. I mean, it's just. It's I, I, I think the exploration in Fallout Four is better than in New Vegas. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think once there are certain sections in four, especially like when you're in the cities where it's just I don't know. To me, I there like like the comic book shop. On. Like if you yeah, hack Uber's... the computer, you can look at their order list mm-hmm. and like see what books are most popular with their customers. Did you find the parking garage that was set up with traps? Yeah. And ultimately, when you get to the final two cages, you have to choose which one you want. Yeah. The no, there's, and, and like, I like the background conversations. They're really weird. There's mm-hmm. this one point where there's two raiders, like, talking about, they're like, there's this guy. He just ran towards me. Then he started throwing grenades <laughs> yeah. like crazy. Yeah. I don't know what he was doing. It was so weird. And, like, I'm like, wait, are they talking about me? Yeah, and then right. I realized they weren't. And it was just some other weird person. I accidentally saved the life of a serial killer. Mm-hmm. Like, and I was totally, I think I missed it actually at the beginning part of a quest mm-hmm. and then wandered into this so i was like what's going on and i'm like yeah i'll save that guy and then yeah, I, I save a serial killer that i go upstairs and like find all these people he's tortured to death i'm like whoops yeah i did probably that shouldn't have done that and then later on in a quest somebody was like you know there's a lot of weird things going on in this house could you go check it out and i was like i already did it so i just <laughs> kind of was like yeah it was crazy man i don't know what happened no and if you go off map it gets it gets really weird <laughs> Like, I don't want to minimize, like, my enjoyment of, of exploration. I just, I don't like exploring in Fallout 4. Like, mm-hmm. and it's not that I don't like exploring in video games because, like, you know, when I sit down with, like, Witcher 3 or even Oblivion, it was just, like, like all I would want to do is, like, run around and see what exists in mm-hmm. this world. And I just, like, every time I get that urge in Fallout 4, I'm disappointed. Like, I'll find a crumbling building or a dead tree mm-hmm. or something. Thing and it's like uh yeah, yeah I, I genuinely like hearing other people's stories about what happens to them in fallout mm-hmm. uh far more than i've enjoyed playing any of it like right here when you guys were talking like that's that's great to hear because y'all are so excited about stuff that you do in the game and it's interesting mm-hmm. or i have a friend who uh likes telling me stories about his new vegas playthroughs uh one time he apparently bloated up on stealth And the scene where some main bad guy has, like, ten guards and is standing around telling you how unbeatable he is. My friend's like, yeah, I just sniped each and every one of his guards from far away and then watched him stand there amongst the dead bodies of his guards talking about how unbeatable he was. They're like, that's hilarious. From an exploration standpoint, I, I prefer like something like Borderlands 2 to Fallout 4. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the first the first Borderlands was like all desert, but the second Borderlands had a lot of variety in its in its locations and stuff, and I really liked running around and exploring. And uh, In one of the Borderlands games, there was some guy who really wanted you to shoot him in the face. 
And it's just like, he's like, shoot me in the face. Come on, shoot me in the face. Knock, knock. Who's there? Shoot me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> the writing in Borderlands, especially too, is, is just so great. There's this YouTube channel. I think it's Then Thapple, T-H-E-N-T-H-A-P-P-L-E, where this guy basically just goes around throughout the Fallout games to specific like locations and just kind of like dissects the stories or the mythos behind what he thinks happened based on like you know you find the body here it looks like blah 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 and uh i think that's pretty enjoyable Mm -hmm. i i like it when people kind of explore the background narrative of games Mm -hmm. i mean i i really strongly feel like video games should be telling their stories that way like environmentally and you know letting you piece the stories together yourself rather than like oh we have to have a cutscene you gotta watch this because like you know that's how a movie tells its story Mm -hmm. you know as as much ire as i have towards the dark souls series like that's one of the things dark souls does really great Mm -hmm. is you know setting up its lore setting up its story in these really subtle ways and i think fallout and your borderlands and your you know elder scrolls games like are also very good at setting up stories Mm -hmm. that you know you might not even ever finish the story Mm -hmm. but like you have to piece it together through exploration through Mm -hmm. finding things on your own and through discovery and that's a way a video game can tell a story that other media really can't there was a cool element in the mad max game where you'd find um relics of the past i think is what they were called postcards pictures signs cards you know and you can read them um if they had like a message written on them or whatever and it would kind of give you just a glimpse into the world slightly before it went to hell as it was going to hell after it had gone to hell you know just to kind of flesh out these small little back stories that i thought was pretty nice touch oh so here's one for you uh no man's sky is that hard sci-fi like i don't know at this point because i haven't played it but i will say that i'm ridiculously excited for it i think that goes without saying (laughs) (laughs) i just want to go i I just want to go on record to say (laughs) since i haven't said it before (laughs) i'm very excited for no man's sky i actually haven't talked about that game uh, before so it's good to get it out (laughs) i've never talked about it before no i actually just pre-ordered the like special edition oh you son of a gun and i was like so excited i forgot to do it the first day and then i did it right like at like seven in the morning on the the second day it was available so which one is that is that the 120 dollar one you get the no i didn't go i didn't go pc one oh okay yeah i went with the ps4 and i was just talking with a guy at gamestop the other day and he's like good thing you you ordered that when you did because that sold out in two days it was sold out everywhere by gamestop when yeah. you did it too mm-hmm but, like, all the stuff we were talking about storytelling, it really feels like No Man's Sky is going to have that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think I think we're going to be seeing a lot of those videos where people are like, hey, you know, this is a thing I found, and let's try to figure out what it means. Mm-hmm. And, you know, trying to create a bigger context for it. Yeah. And I think that's how the developers of the game want people to interact with it. Uh, they have a bunch of alien languages they created for No Man's Sky, and so initially when you try and interact with people of alien races, you might not be able to communicate at all and you'll just sort of have to guess, but you can slowly learn these languages over time. Really? Yeah. And so you can like become fluent in one alien language and like ignore others or you can like learn little pieces so you can maybe make enough to say the right thing mm-hmm. Oh man! or do the right mm-hmm. thing. So that's bet- a huge part of trade interaction in No Man's Sky is that a lot of the races you encounter will not be able to communicate with you until you take the time to learn some of their language. Mm-hmm. I bet uh, Greg Johnson of Toji Mineral fame would be super into that. Um, I talked with him and he was actually uh, really into linguistics and he was really into, you know, the hypothetical study of alien linguistics mm-hmm. was one of the things he was really into. Yeah, I was watching like a impressions video from like some gameplay that a guy had to experience and he said there was... He's on a planet, comes across like a scientist, and the guy's just speaking his language, and he's like, I don't know. He's trying to offer him something, and the scientist just like looks at him like, what are you doing, you know? And <laughs> no, slowly I, he that's learned, my favorite like, thing in survival games and... is the human component, and that's what most survival games ignore. Oh, so yeah. I like pathologic so much. Like so. truly being in an alien environment. Right. You know. I saw stuff where like people desperately needed parts, and like they pissed off the people they could communicate with because they accidentally said something of 
defensive or like responded badly and then they like couldn't find a way to get their parts and they were freaking out mm-hmm. like i love stuff like that um there's a game sign mora by grasshopper manufacturer mm-hmm. you know, suda 51's thing mm-hmm. i don't know if he would directly worked on it or not um, but they worked as a publisher. All the dialogue in Sign Mora was recorded in Hungarian. Mm-hmm. And when they translated it to English, they just subtitled it. Mm. You know, it's kind of like a crazy sci-fi, you know, spaceship flying game. Mm-hmm. And because they left it in Hungarian, it completely changed the feel of the game. It was so like so it was such a good choice of just making you feel like you were in this crazy world. And they had a lot of like anthropo- uh, anthropomorphic animals and stuff, like a big animal dudes that are like talking to you in Hungarian and stuff. <laughs> and so it just felt like it felt so alien that it felt really appropriate for the yeah, game. That's cool. I think No Man's Sky is going to be hard as shit. People, I think, aren't going to be ready for how hard I think it's going to be. Yeah, no, I, I saw that one demo video and the person just screwed themselves over in like five minutes and they were trying to figure out how they could get out of it. Yeah. I mean, it, it almost is just like an open world sandbox puzzle kind of a game, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it's warm. survival mechanics are a lot more intense it's than brutal. I think people think they are. Mm-hmm. I just hope it's good because with all this build up by this point there's going to be some people who are going to be pissed off and think mm-hmm. it's a shitty game if it doesn't give them a blowjob immediately mm-hmm. you know well if it is universally um viewed as being a terrible game i think it will bring about the collapse of yet another video game industry right no we'll, we'll have the uh the second video game crash yeah instead of a landfill though they'll just blast it out in the space yeah, right space trash space trash and then and then the, there'll be an urban legend about the satellite with all the copies of no man's sky in orbit around the planet or it'll like crash land on an asteroid or something yeah. right <laughs> And then, you know, 50 years later, they'll they'll go dig it all up. And right. like, oh, it was true. <laughs> we actually found the copies of No Man's Sky. Like, with the E.T. thing, like, I didn't, like, I refused to look into it because I I wanted to believe it. And I I had a feeling it was just an urban legend. Mm-hmm. And then it ends up, it, it was true. Like To a well, certain degree. I mean, I, I kind of knew it was true ish because you know companies have to get rid of of trash mm-hmm. you know parts that were rejected parts mm-hmm. you know broken whatever and where are you gonna put it a landfill in well, that uh... probably they had a bunch of leftover copies of et so they tossed it with the you know broken electronic parts in the landfill well there was that documentary to go dig it up and yeah i mean they found et but they found other games i mean it was like they're not selling at this point. What are you going to do with them and just throw them in the garbage? Right. Yeah, I mean, like it. It was. It was true more or less. ET, you'll find Space Invaders. But I mean. it. It. It wasn't the way people like to tell it, which was this game was so terrible that you know the Atari just went to the desert and got rid of it all, mm-hmm. like some kind of mob hit or something. Yeah, they brought it out back, put a potato sack on his head, and <laughs> you're right. Popped it twice and said adios, Charlie. You know, put put some cement shoes on the bottom of every single cartridge. Yeah. Toss it into the East River. (laughs) (laughs) So, we've talked about video games. We've talked about sci-fi conventions. Let me posit this question. What if there was a video game set in a sci-fi convention? There there is one. It looks pretty terrible (laughs) to me. It's it's called Randall's Monday. Mm. It's uh, got Jay and Silent Bob in it, and they got the guy who voiced Randall from Clerks to be Randall. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and it's got really, it looks like it's aimed at the sort of people who, for their type of humor is, that's a reference to a thing I like. Mm-hmm. It's not my type of humor, so it looks like the worst game in the world to me. Wow. But it, it does have a sci-fi convention with lots of references to things you like. Hmm. I got invited to a movie premiere once, and uh, Jason Mewes was there because uh, it was his movie. Um, it was a movie called Noobs, and so they invited a bunch of, of a bunch of game press to to go to the premiere. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of crazy because I've never done anything like that. But like <clears throat> they did the whole like red carpet, and they had you know like Jason Mewes was there, and like Zelda Williams was in the movie, and she was there, and uh, Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite was there, but mm-hmm. I didn't recognize him because he had like this big like handlebar mustache and like What's his name John something like crazy long hair and stuff. And uh, for some reason, Ron Livingston was there. 
know. And he wasn't even in the, like, I don't think he was in the movie. I didn't see him in the movie. What what you don't realize is that Ron Livingston is everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, probably. <laughs> well, I'm Ron Livingston. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, no, this is true. A bunch of people on the internet think I'm Ron Livingston because I made a page called Ron Livingston Fan Page as a joke on Facebook. And every week I get messages from people who think I'm Ron Livingston. <laughs> and, like, there's this one person who'll be like, hey, Ron, remember the time you blah, 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 blah. And, like, remember the time you were in that movie with so-and-so? And then there's, like, this one guy who's like, hi, Ron, I met a guy on vacation. He looked just like you. Here are some pictures. And, like, he looks nothing like Ron Livingston. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know how to respond to this because I'm not Josh, so I'm not going to type back and pretend to be Ron Livingston. Mm-hmm. But I also don't want to tell them I'm not Ron Livingston <laughs> because it's really funny to, like, get these Facebook notifications and then it's a message for Ron Livingston. <laughs> For the record, the noobs movie is pretty terrible. Mm-hmm. It is the humor. That's a reference to a thing you like. The humor. I don't remember. That's a remember. reference to a video like, game. You like video yeah. games, that, right? Cliffy, it's like the lower level of that. That's a reference to a thing you like. Uh, Cliffy B was there because the, the movie revolves around Gears of War. Mm. And so Cliff Blazinski was there. Jason Mewes seemed kind of bummed out about it. And and we were sitting just a, a, like two rows behind him when the uh when the movie was playing and we were trying to like make fun of how bad the movie was, but we didn't want <laughs> we didn't want him to hear us. <laughs> Should have been like not as good as that movie you made with Manny Santos. <laughs> James Jason Mewes. You should have gotten Manny Santos again. You need more Canadian in this movie. For the re- Jay and Silent Bob were regulars on Degrassi the Next Generation and they actually made a movie and cast it with characters from Degrassi like if they were in character in that universe they're Degrassi characters and then Degrassi characters as themselves are in their fictional Jane and Silent Bob movies and I think they even made a musical they kept it going a long yeah. time I, yeah. I don't know why this happened you can even buy DVDs called Jane and Silent Bob do Degrassi wow. which is really inappropriate because all those kids are underage man <laughs> Underage Canadian children. Yeah. No no sex should be implied. No. Getting back to your original question. Yeah. Uh, I actually think it, if somebody decided to do it. Somebody uh, it did would... do it. We answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you would let me finish. Uh, if somebody decided to do this particular thing I'm about to talk about, uh, it would be really interesting to see a sur- hardcore survival game set at a convention. Because, you know, like, conventions are infamous for having a bunch of, like, junk food, but it being really hard to get actual meals. Con crud is a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to run around not pissing off the guest of honor, trying to, like, get to the panel. Like, so figuring out the various entertaining survival mechanics for having a good time at a convention without winding up, you know, hating yourself uh, on Sunday evening because you ate nothing but M&Ms all weekend. Mm-hmm. And that that would be an entertaining game. I'd kind of like to see that if somebody would do it. Hmm. Well, look, folks. I think we're we're here. I think we've reached our final destination. That I, was a horror movie. Yeah. No, it was. You were supposed to say I it was the final frontier. I wasn't. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> look, man. Sci-fi, it's cool. I like it. I've played a lot of good sci-fi games. I've seen a lot of bad ones, but that's everything. You know, so I'd just like to thank you all for joining us once again. It's been a pleasure. Half Glass Gaming, out. I was attacked really badly by someone when I was a little kid. I had like those little plastic bracelets that were big in the 80s and because my arms were so skinny, they fell off. Mm-hmm. And so I was picking them up and the swan thought I was trying to get his babies and so it started beating me. Oh, wow. It's so very graceful. So like they swans had to get big. people to get the swan off. Swans wow. are vicious little fuckers. Or vicious big fuckers. No, I mean, I couldn't even get away because I was really little. But right. mm-hmm. Waterfowl in general are just terrible creatures. Mm. <laughs> They're foul.